Hi, I'm Jim Overholt. I'm the senior scientist for autonomous systems at the Air Force Research Laboratory. Today I'm joined by Chris Kearns, my friend and colleague at, at AFRL, and we're going to tell you about the S&T strategy for autonomous systems. And like Jim said, I'm, the, I'm Chris Kearns. I'm the portfolio manager for AFRL. And about two years ago, we set out on a journey to establish what is our vision and what, is, what are the goals. And so our vision is all about creating intelligent machines that are seamlessly integrated with people, with our operators. And we broke that down then into four goals. The first goal is about highly effective human machine teams. The second goal is about teams of machines working together. The third goal is about com working in complex environments and performing their mission in complex environments. And then the fourth one is all about how do we test, evaluate, verify, and validate that these are behaving in the way that we want them to behave. Today what we're going to do is we're going to dig down deeply into the human machine teaming goal and give a little bit more understanding about what do we mean and what do we say and how do we envision this human machine team coming together. Right. And so what we've done is we took each one of these goals and we've identified what are the enduring problems. And these enduring problems become long-term challenges. They're not, they're not technology programs that I can put in place in the near term and I can fix it, I can solve it. But these are things that we are going to have to deal with over and over again. And we're going to have to spend time figuring out and improving the solutions that we came up with. So under these highly effective human machine teams, we came up with three enduring problems. The first problem is about what we call enable and calibrate trust. And really, I think what we clue on is, is it's, it's really about calibrated trust. So it's making sure that people can trust the technology, trust this intelligent machine, based on what they want it to do, what it's supposed to be doing in the particular environment in which it is operating. So it isn't about just having trust and using the technology, but it's having the right amount of trust in the particular si situation that it is operating in, in that mission context. And that's, and that's a great point, and it's one of the key areas that researchers are looking at right now in terms of trust. And there's, and there's two sides of that. There is the lack of trust in systems. Will this system perform in a way that, that I'm expecting it to do? And certainly, you know, that's a concern, especially as we start rolling out these kind of systems. An equal concern, and in many ways potentially even more dangerous, is overtrust of systems. So this, this notion of calibration that Chris talks about is absolutely critical because we have to have the right amount of trust for the particular situation we're in. And this is one of the key enduring research problems that we looked at in the human machine teaming area. The second then enduring problem is about creating these, this uh, common understanding and shared perception. So if we want humans and machines to work together, what they have to be able to do is understand what, they are, what is going on in their environment, be able to communicate that to, the, to their partner, and, and do that in a means that they can effectively communicate and share what's going on and understand what's going on in their environment. And, and you think about, you know, humans, you know, even you and I, you know, working together, we, we start to learn each other's uh, uh, traits and, and tendencies and, and trying to get machines to start understanding how humans operate, what they, what they mean in their uh, body motions, their little gestures. This is a real critical area. And if you're going to have humans very tightly coupled with an intelligent machine capable of making decisions, they have to come to some common understanding about what are those factors at the particular time in order to make that decision. So if they're talking two different languages, and we've all had to deal with working obviously with people from a foreign country, we don't know the language, it's extremely difficult to try to come to some common understanding, common consensus. So it's a, also a problem when it comes to computer systems, intelligence systems, as well as humans. And so the third goal then is about, and you kind of led into it a little bit, it's about creating an environment mm -hmm. so that you can have this effective and shared decision making. And I always like to, to go back to the example today, the way that we interact with technology oh, yeah. is we are taught how to use keyboards, mm -hmm. we are taught how to use mice, our pilots are taught how to use a joystick, right. not necessarily the most intuitive manner in which I interact. Right. And so I use my hands, I nod, I give you a lot of nonverbal communication. I use, I use, we use voice, we use touch, we, we have lots of ways that we communicate. Creating this ability to interact with a machine in the sure. same manner will, I think, improve the ability for us to operate together, people to operate with machines, these intelligent machines. And, and you know, and, and it's interesting from a robotic standpoint, one of the things that are really interesting, and of course, we know about Siri, we know about the different things that understand what a, what a human is saying at some level. 
but there are other ways of communicating, like you said. So we're interested in can we give hand signals? Can you can you notice something that's going on with a with a human in terms of maybe raising an eyebrow or the change in their body posture? It's also like this this environment for this effective decision making has rapidly got to take in all the different data streams, all the different attributes of a scene, and we, it has to be able to coalesce those in such a way that the two entities or the multiple entities making a decision have to rapidly be able to, if you want to call it, digest all that information and make the decision. That isn't easily done. Think about a bunch of people in a room and trying to come to a consensus when they're all looking at different papers and they're, and they're, they're looking at uh, different types of data sources. How do we do that now with machines and humans and making sure that again that we there's a trust between the decision and making sure that we have this 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 flexible effective decision making so what we've done is we've set out on tried to explain a little bit in these enduring problems yeah. what our vision is but let's go into that a little bit deeper yeah. so if you look at the world today today we use machines as tools they are they are they are more advanced than a screwdriver but they are essentially they are a tool mm -hmm. And it's because of the things that we've talked about. I don't know what it's doing. I can't understand what decisions it's made. I don't understand what it's taking in. And I have to work and interface through it with a, with a keyboard, with a joystick, with a mouse. And so in, in the world of today, we have machines as tools. Mm -hmm. What we envision is a world of tomorrow where, where machines are our, our teammates. Mm -hmm. And it's a seamless partnership between the, between the machine and the person. And so we have things like more intuitive ways to interface. We can use things like I can talk to it. Yep. I can touch a screen and I can say, go here. Mm -hmm. It can pick up on my nonverbal communications. Mm -hmm. And I give a hand movement and, that's, and it means something. So those kind of interactions, we start sharing understanding of what's going on in the environment. And it doesn't mean that we have the same understanding, but we start sharing what our understanding is. And between the two, then we can make more effective decisions. You know, it's, and you're hitting on one of the parts that you'll, you'll see us talk about more and more. When you start coupling that machine and you start coupling the human together, there needs to be, a, we, we like to refer to it as a bi-directional information flow. And this bi-directional information flow idea is currently we get most of the information from the machine. We see a future in this vision that says the machine is able to start pulling information off of the human. And that's going to be, as we go through the rest of this segment, a real key, key critical piece for where we're going. Understanding of the, the physiological, behavioral, emotional context of the human and how do we couple that along with information processing with the with the machine. These are key areas and they're very unique in terms of as we start launching out into the uh, into our vision in terms of implementing human machine teaming. The the one thing that we we really try to highlight then is this notion that um, this effective decision making shared common understanding is an absolutely critical piece. It's that enduring problem space that Chris talked about that we need to actually work on over these next years in order to see what that vision is, in order to see bi-directional flow, in order to see this kind of shared uh, perception between the two. These are key, key areas that we're working on. And so we think the way to get to effective autonomous systems is through this, this human-machine teaming that we've mm -hmm. talked about. And when we say, what does that mean? It includes things like the calibrated trust that we talked about. Yes. It includes training together. It includes, it includes that common understanding, shared perception, and this bi-directional flow of information. And when we think about that in the context of the Air Force mission, it isn't a particular application. It isn't a particular mission that the Air Force executes. It cuts across the entire domain of, mm -hmm. of, of what the Air Force does. So things like we call you know these these UAV these unmanned vehicle mm -hmm. operators. It can it includes command and control aspects. Our satellites and our space operators, our weapons operators, our ISR analysts. So the guys that are taking in the intelligence and making information out of it that you can make decisions. On. So there's a broad spectrum of just about everything the Air Force does that's an application space for this human machine teaming and bringing the two together. Uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a collaborative manner. And, and it really hits on one of the, our, our earliest points. Autonomy is not just about um, 
platforms. It is about all of these different domains and all the kinds of missions and all the kinds of jobs that airmen have to do currently and in the future. So we have to then say this is all great, this is all nice to t hear about, but what really do we need to develop from a technology perspective? Mm -hmm. And so we have taken this and we have broken it into, I think we have five key areas that, that we think are important to focus on now that will enable us to make progress towards these human machine teams. And so the first one is about human state sensing and assessment. And I think on the surface this one will seem odd to us, but let's think about it this way. I am driving my car down the road and I am using the navigation system on my car to get me to a location that I've never been to before. And as I'm within that last 1,000 feet, my car pops up on my navigation screen, change your oil in 2,000 miles. Well, wouldn't it have been great for my car to know she's stressed out, she's trying to figure out where she's going, maybe I can wait till right. she's not in this right. situation to right. say, mm -hmm. you need to change oil in 2,000 miles. In order to make something like that happen, we think that what we have to do is we have to provide data on what's going on with the person. Absolutely. So if the, if the machine could sense I'm under stress, mm -hmm. if the machine knew that, that maybe I'm even sweating a little bit, my heart rate is up, these are the kind of sensors that we could, we could then tell what's going on with the person. In some Air Force missions, what we would also do then is incorporating in how are they performing the duties that they need to be performing. Right. So the assessment piece. So, mm -hmm. right. So, so if we can sense them and then we can say how are they doing, mm -hmm. then the machine will be able to now team with me and be more able to support me in what I'm trying to do. And, and you know, this is not something that's science fiction or something that's brand new. You look at what's going on in personalized health right now and you see people taking different devices and they're measuring their, their heart rate. They're measuring a, a variety of different data and they're trying to use that information in such a way that they are trying to improve their health. And these are the kind of things that we are looking at, harvesting, researching to see where these kind of devices could potentially give us some kind of information on the physiolo physiological aspects of the human, looking at the behavioral aspects. These are the kind of things that that particular area really kind of dwells on. All right, so we can pick up these technologies now and we can militarize them. We can put them into a military environment Absolutely. and then we can figure out how do we assess what's going on with our operators sure. so that then now the, the we can interface the the people in the machines. Mm -hmm. Which brings us to our second area, which is how do we effectively mach interface humans and machines? Yeah. We talked earlier about right. we all learn how to use keyboards and mice and joysticks. Well, we can do better than that. Sure. Technology exists today that I can, I can touch a, a screen and I can point to things on a screen and I can interface and interact with a, a machine that way. Being able to communicate by, by voice is, is coming up to where we might be able to utilize it in our environments. But in the future, think about 20, 30 years from now, sure. absolutely we ought to have systems that I can talk to and I can direct by, by verbally. In addition to we're starting to see things coming out of the gaming community right. on, on being able to understand what this means. Right. Mm -hmm. so, so improving that interaction between the human and the machine is definitely a research area for us. And, and, and we, we don't look at these thrusts as being so unique and orthogonal to each other. In other words, this idea of sensing the human ties beautifully into how do we, okay, start developing interfaces between humans and machines. And this is exactly where this is going. Monitor and assess the human, have him integrated with the, the kind of command and control that he's got to do for some kind of intelligent system. Really key. Right. And so then, so, so in order to do that, then the next step becomes if I want to share my work, mm -hmm. if I want to allocate tasks, mm -hmm then we, it's, there's a fundamental underlying science uh, be, that allows us to then say, what are the tasks? How do I break them down? How do we, how do we think through things? Mm -hmm. And then how do you put a human and a machine together so that the human can say, you do that, I'll do this. Mm -hmm. The machine to be able to say, I can't do that. And, and being able to share the tasks and the cognitive work that needs to go. be done in most of our missions. So that cognitive task analysis, cognitive science starting to, like you said, look at work, how work uh, flows, how the humans interact with the tasks that they're being assigned, and the cognitive science part, which is starting to understand how humans process information. There's, this is a science that's been around since the 60s. At the same time, artificial intelligence kicked off, 
and the, the efforts right now in terms of incorporating in models of the brain and models how we take in information, be able to process, access memory, all these different things, we are, we are heavily exploring those areas to be able to see what can we harvest from those kind of research uh, uh, fields to be able to put them into machines to start trying to think and reason like humans. So then our fourth area is about w what we, we say it's, it's human learning, it's machine learning, and then it's human and machine learning. So yes. if you break that down, it's humans learning about machines and learning how to interact with them, machines learning about that person and, and what are their preferences, what are the things that they would do, and then now let's put the human and the machine together and let them train together and, and be become an efficient and effective team. And, and, and this is such a unique area as well because if we look at a future where an airman is partnered with a potentially an intelligent system, then that this intelligent system we see as being personalized, uh, potentially being part of that airman through his career, and which means the intelligent system has to have the capability to be able to um, know his tendencies, know his likes, understand when he's at, at top performance, on these kind of things. Is finish what his sentences. <laughs> we finish his sentences, there you go. These kind of things, uh, but you're, you're better than a machine. So, um, but, but these are the kind of things, so when you look at, at this idea of the two systems coming together and learning together, that is an absolutely unique new area that, again, we think is absolutely necessary if we're looking at this vision of autonomy in the future. And so underpinning all of that then is a whole lot of data and a whole lot of understanding of that data, which is our fifth area. So pulling together the data that people understand, the data that human or the machine will understand, being able to, to put it together, knowing that we as people understand it in different context time format. Mm -hmm. Machines have their own context time and format. How do, you, how do you integrate the two so that you have this shared understanding of what's going on in the world and with the teammates. And so we then, the emphasis heavily then depends on not only bringing the data but ver varying the data in such a way that it's understandable by the, the, the entities who are going to be looking at it and being able to rapidly do that. And it still ties back to these notions that we had of sensing the human, what is the human feeling right now, how do I have to change the data in such a way that maybe they'll process it in a much faster way. So these kind of things all tie together, they're not individual swim lanes, but they're really critical and it's what we feel are the absolute five areas we need to really look at and spend time in research and development over these next 20, 25 years and out into the future to really um, realize this vision of human-machine teaming. So I think hopefully what we've done is we've given a pretty clear understanding of, mm -hmm. of what we mean by human-machine teaming mm -hmm. and the kind of effective human-machine teams that yeah. we want to develop. And so in future podcasts, I think what we're going to do is we will go through each of the other goals that we have in our strategy. Yeah, as a matter of fact, the, the next one, we're going to talk about scalable teams of autonomous systems. So this notion of taking multiple um, intelligent systems, autonomous systems together and being able to see how will they operate to handle tasks and deal with humans.